and with bodily harm and with injury enables the wife to seek criminal compensation for violence. So I think it's extremely important to, um, to, make, to make that distinction. Um, so, so when people talk about marital rape, um, and, 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 and it's broadly defined as just having sexual intercourse with your wife without consent, um, I think we must make that distinction. Um, having sexual intercourse with your wife without her consent and without violence and assault is wrong under the Sunnah. It is not a criminal offense. When it is accompanied by violence and injury, it is a criminal, a criminal offense. But the institution of marriage, the contract of marriage, is a contract that allows the man and the woman access to each other's sexuality. Now, you can, of course, think of a case of uh, possibly the woman herself raping a man. Yes, um, it may not be, um, a, a, it may not be um, um, a ladylike thing to do, but it's not a crime. You know, it's, she has a right to do it, it's, you know, um, but, and that is really uh, the, way, uh, uh, the, the way the law, uh, the, the law has it. And I think um, one of the challenges that we have when we have these conversations is um, this, when you tell scholars you want to criminalize um, uh, marital rape, what, 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 what comes to their mind is you want to make it a crime for a man to have sex with his wife without, without a consent. So we need to, we need to make that, uh, that distinction. Now, um, this brings me to the issue of domestic uh, violence in general and also the whole question of age of marriage and so on. And these are issues that we came across when we're trying to, to make the law. Um, now, take the case of age of marriage or wife beating. In, in, in Islamic jurisprudence, when, 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 when there's an, a statement, a, a command, as we know, um, a command can, or can, can be, um, it, could, it could just simply um, indicate, oh, this is something that, um, it, could, it, could, it could be something that um, is permissible, it could be something that is desirable, it could be something that is compulsory. So um, take marriage. Marriage is a sunnah, and marriage is desirable. In fact, in some cases, in the, cases of, in the case of um, a person who cannot control his sexual urges and who has ability to, ma to marry, it becomes um, even obligatory. Now, so marriage itself is sunnah. But marrying a woman at a particular age is a matter of choice. There is no value attached to it. It's just permissible. So nobody says that if you marry um, someone at the age of six or seven, you have a higher reward than someone who marries a woman at the age of 18. And if you take the prophet's life, um, uh, even if you accept, um, and again, like Noor, I, I have serious reservations about the hadith on the age of Aisha, but if you accept um, uh, uh, those, uh, those reports that uh, you would find a whole range uh, of years at which you marry women. One of, one of them, a Khadija in one of the uh, narrations say that, um, Khadija was um, married at the age of 40. So um, you, if you take it the Sunnah, it can be all those ages. Now, in Usul al fiqh there is a rule. This rule is called Qaida Taqiyid al-Mubah. It's a rule of placing limitations on that which is permissible. And the idea is, if something is just permissible, not desirable, and not obligatory, if it causes damage, the government can restrict it. So, for example, in Islamic law, the government of Nigeria cannot have a law that says you cannot marry because marriage is sunnah. But it can have a law that says you cannot marry a girl before a certain age because marrying a girl at a young age is just mubah, it's just permissible. It is not desirable, it is not compulsory. And that is, for example, when we started um, trying to write the law, my position was that we needed to have a minimum age of marriage. And this has been done in Morocco, it's been done in uh, uh, Malaysia, it's been done in Egypt, it's been done in Syria, it's been done in other Muslim countries. We were not able to do that. And, and you know, we had a long conversation. The law, that, uh, the, the law we finally had had about 70, 80 percent of what I wanted. It didn't have 100 percent, but I was happy that we could get to 80 percent. And that we know we can also look at... Uh, uh, look, look at amendments. But, but, but in this conversation, I think we need to um, bring some nuance and some, uh, and some detail in, into this analysis. You know, we keep talking about the age of marriage, and um, 
and, and I'm sure if you look at, um, say, the verse in Surah Al-Nisa, uh, you'll find that um, the, the, the different schools of law, when they talked about reaching the stage of marriage, gave a number of options. Some of them are the physical signs of puberty, but some of them also are using the age. And in, interestingly, in Maliki law, the age is 18. Uh, in Shafi'i law, it's 15, if you look at the, the tafsir of, of that verse. But in, in, in trying to write this law and uh, fix an age of marriage and discussing with the scholars, I realized that there's a sense in which we also have uh, an elite type of conversation. For all the people in this uh, forum, for example, um, none of our daughters uh, would be married before they finished secondary school, before they finished university, and they'd be 18, they'd be over 20. And it is inconceivable to us that a girl child, for example, will have nothing to do uh, be be below that age. Now, as an emir and dealing with poor people in villages, you come across the stark reality that this issue may not even be a religious issue. It may not even be an issue with the scholars or with the people. We have been blaming the victim. Go to the villages in northern Nigeria. How many villages actually have secondary schools? How many have primary schools and teachers? Now, the problem, if you take, if you take a man in a village, let's say there's a primary school in the village and the girl finishes primary school at the age of 11. There is no secondary school. There's no technical, te te technical skills center. There's no provision for this girl for what she's supposed to do. Between the age of 11 and the age of 18, what is this girl doing? So, you know, we can talk about a minimum age. We can say 18, we can say 17, but tell me what will that girl be doing up to the age of 18? And you see, this is, this is where in our discourse, we need to be honest and bold. It is easy to blame poor people for marrying off their girls at the age of 12 or 13. It is more difficult to blame a governor for not providing education for girls. It is easy for us to say we are so concerned about young girls. We don't want them to get married at the age of 13 and 14 are we not concerned that they don't have an education? Are we not concerned that they're not being taught life skills? So um, if we actually focused on the rights of every girl to an education, say up to senior secondary school, and if we held our political authorities responsible for building the schools, for providing the teachers, for providing the scholarships. Once a girl finishes secondary school, she's already 18. You don't get, you don't get away from this debate about whether it is 17 or 18. If you go to the UK, if you go to the United States, if you go to Europe, all of these, um, all of these girls at, by 18, they have finished secondary school. But it is not enough to tell people, don't marry off your daughter until she's 18. What, are, what have you provided for her? So the difficult conversation we need to have is to ask ourselves, this age of marriage, and, 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 I, and you know, I went through a learning process because I became an emir with the typical elite mindset of our people in the North wanting to marry their children off. It was being an emir, coming face to face with the reality of poor people, that you realize that they, okay, they want to educate the girl, but where is the school? Or she goes to primary school and comes out and she has learned nothing. And he sees education as useless. So if we really want to deal with age of marriage, it, and it is important, we should deal with education for girls. And insist that our girls must be educated and they must be educated up to senior secondary school. Because look, even, even now, um, there's a Universal Basic Education Act. The UBE Act makes it a legal offense for a girl to be married before she finishes junior secondary school. And it says that the imam or the pastor who contract the marriage and the parents 
and the house where it is contracted, all of those are offenses. How many people are brought to court for marrying off girls before they finish junior secondary school? They are not. Why? Because the schools are not there. The education has not been provided. So the person who is supposed to implement the law, the person who is supposed to take the children and, and take the parents to, to court, it is in the UB Act, yes. I saw somebody asking, yes, go and read the UB Act. The person who is supposed to sue um, the parent for marrying off his child at the age of 13 cannot sue that parent because he did not provide the school. He did not provide the teachers. And so if we see that sometimes uh, we are blaming a victim, I'm, I'm not saying that uh, people, do, people need to be enlightened, need to be educated on the dangers of child marriage. We see VVF. We see a lot of domestic violence that happens. But we must understand that the poor people in this country are victims of a system that has marginalized them. Their voices are not heard. They're crying. Their children don't have an education. The villages don't have the schools. They don't have the teachers. And we need to address these fundamental issues of development before we can succeed in our objective as far as um, age of marriage is concerned. Now, um, but the same principle of Chakid um, uh, al-Mubah applies to this, uh, this whole issue of um, of wife beating. You know, when, when you talk about um, uh, Adar, it's true. There's um, a verse of the Quran that uh, talks about how you deal with a woman in the case of Nishus, recalcitrance. And it says, And it gives this um, three um, sequential acts of um, admonition and dialogue and then um, uh, desertion from of, uh, separation uh, from the bed, and uh, then also um, uh, this light beating. Now, it was one of the issues that we dealt with when we're trying to to write the law. Um, and, I'll, and I'll tell you again, um, my position is if you look at uh, Ibn Ashur, for example, uh, Ibn Ashur in his tafsir uh, at Tahrir wa Tanwir talks about this case. He says, look, first of all, it is extremely difficult to define the scope of this beating. Um, and even if you define it, it is extremely difficult for people to remain within the scope. So for example, if you take Maliki law, if you take the Muqtasar, the Muqtasar is very, very clear. It says that these three things are sequential. So you start with admonition. You try to talk to her. You try to uh, talk to um, uh, her, um, her parents to talk to her. If that doesn't work, then you... Um, Desert um, her, desert her bed for a period that does not exceed four months. If that doesn't work, and if you convince that a light beating will work, then you do this light beating, and this light beating is with a handkerchief or with a toothpick, um, and it cannot be, uh, it cannot hurt, it cannot injure. You must avoid the face and so on. You've got all these rules around the beating that. Strictly speaking, when you read the Muhtasar, it is a symbolic act, okay, of taking a toothpick or a handkerchief and, 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 and hitting your wife with it. Now, even Ash says, if people are unable to keep within the bounds of that symbolic act, there is nothing in Islam that stops the government from having a law that simply says you cannot beat. Because that, even if the Quran says, what on, it is again like the case of the child marriage. It is an amr lil lil ibaha. It 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 permits. It does not make it true. In fact, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in various hadith says, "I have received reports that some of you beat your wives, and those who beat your wives are not the best. Uh, the the, uh, the best of it." I saw a correction. Yes, uh, siwak is uh, a chewing stick, not to pick. Uh, thanks for that note. Okay, now. Um, if you if you say that um, so he says they are the worst of you, and if you actually look at um, the the sababu nizu the, the circumstance in which that particular verse was revealed uh, what the bohonna, um, it was the case of a woman who came to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and said, my husband beat me, my husband slapped me, and he said go and slap him back. That, that was that was the sabab. So so the prophet's position and the prophet's guidance 
is that hitting your wife is not allowed. And therefore, no one can interpret that verse as um, meaning uh, you can beat your wife because the prophet actually um, explicitly prohibits it from slapping. So when we did the law, the scholars were not ready to take away uh, the, the, the right to beat. We said, okay, well, let's just write what the Maliki law says. So, you, so the law would provide you with the right to beat your wife with a handkerchief. But does it give, but if you slap her, it is assault. If you beat her now, I would have said just prohibit it. But sometimes in legislation, you have to make compromise. Because if you don't take the scholars along, uh, Mal and Nur, what will happen is you pass a law, and on Friday, they only stand, they stand up on, 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 uh, in the mosque, on the pulpit, and say that you have passed a law that, um, um, that it, uh, undermines the verse of the Quran and the hadith of the prophet, and you will have non-compliance. And the judges themselves will have a basis for, non, for not complying, the Sharia court judges. So you have to take along with you the Sharia court judges. You have to take away with you the imams. You have to take, away, to take along with you the, the, the traditional rulers. You have to get a consensus. So if they say we do not want to um, have a law that says it is criminal to be judged, and, and you know it's interesting in the Northern Nigerian Penal Code, and I'm, I'm sure many of you probably don't know that, it is, it is, it is, um, it is almost embarrassing, but if you go to the um, a criminal, criminal assault in the Penal Code of Northern Nigeria, it actually says except when a man beats his wife or when a man beats his servant for the purpose of disciplining them. It is actually there in the law. So the, the penal code of northern Nigeria actually allows a man to beat his wife. And, and so if you, if you now want to get a proper Sharia, you either have to um, criminalize it or um, come back. My view is that you should criminalize, you should stop it, because at, at, at the end of the day, you know, when you look at, uh, when you talk about Taqid al-Mubah, you, you must look at the Maslaha, you look at the general interests of the Ummah. It is not just, in fact, about the beating of the wife and the, uh, and the fact that the woman is brutalized, and that is a, a human right that, that's, uh, that's violated, but uh, just think of it that in the 21st century, a community that allows wife beating is looked at as a backward community and is derogatory. Wife beating may have been okay in the 16th century, 15th century, and that was true. It was true of Muslim society, of Jewish society, of Roman society, of Greek society. But the world has moved on to a point where a community that allows its wife to be beaten is a community that is looked down upon. Now, when we are a community that prides ourselves in being higher ummah, the best of communities, the model society, in the interest of protecting the dignity and integrity of the Muslim community, it is imperative on Muslim leaders to make wife beating illegal. And so, um, for me, um, uh, these are challenges you get when you come to legislate. Um, and and um, one, one of the things I learned was that if you try to run uh, very fast, uh, sometimes you lose the troops, you become like a general who's out there in the war and the, and the, and the troops and troops are not there. When we're having this law, we brought in scholars, we brought in uh, NGOs, uh, we, we, we brought in academics, and we sat down and debated. And like I said, the law does not have 100% of what everybody in this room would like to have, but it, is, um, but it has 80, 80%. Now, the final thing, um, um, uh, one of the notes I made here is this question of a rape victim coming and then people saying, oh, uh, she's lying. You know, Imam Ibn Qayyim in his book, Turq al um, looks at a verse. And, and, and this verse he looks at uh, is, uh, this verse is Surah Al-Hujurat. Ya uh, ayyuhaladina amanu in ja'akum fasikum bin naba'in fatabayyun. O you who believe when um, a fasik, okay, a sinner, or uh, comes to you with a story, investigate, check. And he says, look, Allah did not say, Allah did not say that when a bad person or a, a sinner or uh, an evil, when he, when he, Allah did not say when he comes with a story, reject it. 
He said, investigate it. Now, if you are required to investigate, to confirm, and if you investigate and find that there is corroborating evidence, if it is true, you accept it. Now, he says, if you are to investigate the, sp the, 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 the statement of um, somebody who you know is a bad person, how much more when somebody who is not a bad person gives you a story? How can a girl come and say, I was raped? And without investigation, you say she's lying. In Turku the Sharia is about finding the truth of an allegation. Of course, you will not hold the man and just throw him in jail because she says he raped me. But you, uh, if, you, if you take the Sharia, you are obliged to at least investigate that statement. Okay, where did he do it? What is your evidence? Were there any other witnesses? Take her to a doctor. Let the doctor look at her. Is evidence that she was raped? Is this person known to commit these crimes? Was he there? Was he seen? Because, in, 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 I mean, in evidence, even if he was seen in that place with her at that time, and she says he raped her, and it's something that she was raped, he's guilty. And, and so um, the idea that people should um, reject the evidence of anyone, not talk about a rape victim, does not happen, except in the special cases where you are commanded to reject, such as when somebody comes and says um, somebody committed adultery without four witnesses, then that is, uh, then that, then that is rejected. So these are, I, th I think, um, I've tried to limit myself to the jurisprudence uh, because, um, I mean, the, the, the whole issue of the um, moral issues and ethical issues um, ha have been dealt with. Um, I, I would just round up by, by saying that um, the law only operates within the context of a society. You can have the best laws, okay? Uh, we as people have to encourage people to come out and say that they have been, um, um, they have been victims of rape. Uh, we need to have a police force. We need to have a judiciary that understands that this is something that needs to be dealt with. We need, we need, to, we need to support it. Um, I, I, I had a case uh, in the palace of a woman who came to me and said um, she was battered by her husband, and she went to a Sharia court judge who said, well, you know, well, um, uh, why, why, why would you bring this to court? After all, Allah allows your husband to beat you. And I, I mean, and this was a judge. He said that in open court. And we sent her to the grand cadi and said, look, you, you, need to, you need to call this, this judge to order, because even if uh, you have what, what kind of beating, um, is referred to in that what kind of, of beating is accepted by jurists. But this was a Sharia court judge. So uh, you, you can have the legislation. You also have to train the, uh, the judges. You have to train the lawyers. You have to get society involved. And at the end